Was Jesus actually born on December 25th? Why do we celebrate Christmas on the winter solstice? And did the Catholic Church originally choose that date just because it was an existing pagan holiday to a Roman solar god? We're going to find out all this and more as we travel back in time over 4,000 years ago looking at Egyptian hieroglyphics, ancient Roman artifacts. We'll even dive into the writings of the early church fathers and Catholic bishops and find out what they have to say about the topic. We're going to get to the bottom of this, my friends. Let's put December 25th on trial and find out what the enemy is really trying to hide. Hi, I'm Jim Staley with Passion for Truth Ministries. In this video, we're going to discover the answer to why do we celebrate the birthday of Christ on December 25th. Did the Roman Church choose it simply because it was an existing pagan holiday to a sun god and they wanted to keep Christians from worshiping the sun? Or is there more to the story? We're going to find the answer to those questions and many more in this video. But right off the bat, I want to say that if you consider yourself an academic, you may not agree with every piece of evidence presented in this trial. You don't have to. We all have our own bias, and even the scholars disagree with each other on even the most obvious and clear evidence. Everyone has a bias. At the end of the day, our own court system pronounces guilt when the evidence is just beyond a reasonable doubt. So that's exactly what we're going to do. After all, how much poison needs to be in a glass of water for the whole glass to be polluted? Not much at all. But right now, you might be asking yourself the question, who cares when Jesus was born? What does it matter if the Catholic Church chose December 25th to be the date of his birth, or any other day for that matter? Well, if it was all about us, it wouldn't matter. But the reality is, it's not about us. It's about him. We're worshiping him. And according to Deuteronomy chapter 12, he already told us that we're not allowed to take things, traditions, or days and how the pagans used to worship their gods, look into those, and then creatively borrow from them, Christianize them, throw a little holy water on them, and then offer them up to the one true God. We're not allowed to do that. We're supposed to worship him in spirit and in truth the way he commanded, and we're not allowed to add or take away from that. So if December 25th was in fact the birthday of pagan sun gods, and the Roman church chose to change the birthday of Christ to that day, that would be like me trying to change the birthday of my wife to the birthday of one of my old girlfriends. Imagine if a husband comes up to his wife and says, Honey, I don't want to celebrate your birthday on July 24th anymore. It's just too difficult for me to remember. My old girlfriend had a birthday on October 31st, which happens to be a really popular holiday. It'll be much easier for me to remember if we move your birthday to that day. How well do you think that will go over what? with her? I don't think he'd be married very long at all. If our own wives would be offended at the thought of moving their birthday to one of her arch rivals, how much more the God of the universe who says he's a very jealous God. So this topic is incredibly important. If it's possible for the unsaved to unknowingly offend God, then it's possible for us as believers to offend Him as well without even realizing it. And because mixing the profane with the holy is a big deal to Him, we need to make sure that we're not just blindly following a Catholic holiday schedule when it comes to something so holy as the birth of the Messiah. I believe that God wants a bride that is without spot or wrinkle. And the days of the religious spirit of worshiping God whoever we want, making everything about us, making it all about our feelings, are over with. God is pervading the nations right now and preparing His bride for His return. After all, right now, virtually all Christians are following a religious calendar that was created by the early Roman Church and does not contain a single holiday that's on God's calendar. Could the body of Christ corporately be missing out on blessings and be suffering from a lack of power because it's chosen to worship God through man-made holidays and traditions of men rather than the holy days created by God. If you believe you're a Christian, a believer that wants to worship God in spirit and truth, then we need to look into everything that we believe and find out what spirit does it actually come from, and is it the truth? So we're going to look into this topic today. We're going to put December 25th on trial. We're going to put the Catholic Church on trial. We're going to find out where this came from and how it affects us today. And at the end of this video, I'm going to reveal to you what the enemy is really trying to hide and how he used the Roman church to cover up what God has truly set aside for you. So stick with me as we find out the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So let's begin and uncover all the ancient documents, archaeology, and do a high-level zoom in on some of those ancient quotes and find out if the evidence leads us to a conclusion that we can say is definite. 
Let's start off with an ancient manuscript that was discovered in 1918. It contains 38 sermons that most scholars attribute to John Chrysostom, who lived in the 4th century. Within these sermons that are attributed to Chrysostom is another homily that is said to be by an obscure author named Pontius Maxima. The oldest manuscript that we have of these sermons is from the 9th century. This means that whoever the author is, he was either a contemporary of Chrysostom in the 4th century, or a Christian author sometime after John, but before the 9th century. In this homily, he not only details for us that December 25th was in fact considered by the ancients the birthday of the Roman sun god, but it also helps us understand how the early Christians attempted to appropriate this day and Christianize it. In it, he says this, quote, They also call it, they being the pagans, birthday of the Invictus, which means unconquered. But who is Invictus if not our Lord, who suffered death and then conquered it? Or when they call it birthday of the Son, well, Christ is the Son of Righteousness that the prophet Malachi spoke of. The ancient winter solstice, my friends, which was December 25th, is exactly what is being referenced here. This ancient quote is stating that the pagans, as early as possibly the 4th century, called the winter solstice the birthday of the sun god. This is extraordinarily strong evidence that December 25th was not just the named birth date of Christ, but was also coincidentally the birthday of the Roman sun gods. Furthermore, the above quote is corroborated by even St. Augustine of Hippo himself, who some say is the most influential Christian writer in history next to the Apostle Paul. He tells us in a sermon he gave on Christmas Day in the late 300s, early 400s, that December 25th was still being celebrated by the pagans as a holy day to their sun god. He said this, And so, my brethren, let us hold this day as sacred, not as unbelievers do because of the material sun, but because of him who made the sun. Now, though he is also over that sun even in the flesh, the sun which people worship instead of God, because in their mental blindness they cannot see the true sun of justice. According to Augustine, December 25th was not just the time that they celebrated the birthday of Christ, but the day the pagans worshipped their sun gods through the physical sun. And as you'll see later in this video, this was not just a practice of the pagans in Rome. The winter solstice was celebrated as the birthday of virtually every sun god around the globe in every century and on every continent. But before we go any further, it's important to understand what and why the winter solstice is so important. It's critical to understand the significance of the winter solstice in ancient cultures because almost all sun god worship revolves around it. Why? Because the winter solstice is the shortest day of the year. It's the day when the sun appears to stop and begins to turn back around and the days get longer. So the ancients called it the day when the sun was reborn. This is why sun god's birthdays were on this day, because this is the day that the sun begins to be reborn from their perspective. This is the day when the days begin to get longer and the sun begins to take over the night. And so we will see the winter solstice being used to worship sun gods all throughout time and almost on every continent. Take a look at Newgrange Tomb in Ireland, where there's a small window aligned only with the winter solstice for 17 minutes each year. The window of that tomb was specifically created over 5,000 years ago to harness the sun just for those 17 minutes, right onto the tomb of the ancient chieftains that are inside. Now let's move over to Stonehenge, one of the most popular structures in the history of the world. This over 4,500-year-old pagan sun god worship structure is completely centered around the winter solstice. It's created and built just with the winter solstice in mind. But that's not the only structure. Take a look at Gothic Circle in Germany. It's almost 5,000 years old and is totally created around the winter solstice. Two of the three entrances operate only under the sun of the winter solstice, one at the sunrise and the other at the sunset. But probably the most famous structure in the world history that deals with the winter solstice that is completely connected to a sun god is the Egyptian sun god Amun-Ra. This almost 4,000-year-old temple in Egypt that was built in such a way that only on one single day a year, the winter solstice, the light comes through a single window and shines in the Holy of Holies onto his face. The fact that the ancient Egyptians would build their sun god's temple to harness the sun of the winter solstice because they believed that this was the day that their sun god was reborn 
connects the winter solstice as an existing day of worship to a solar deity. The reason why this is so important is because this established that sun god worship was connected to the winter solstice for thousands of years before Rome was ever built. Long before the birthday of Christ was ever chosen by the Roman church, this day had already been set apart and celebrated by all the ancient cultures before it. And this pattern doesn't just exist before Christ, but long after as well. Even in the Americas, we see Mayan, Incan, Aztec temples all oriented towards the winter solstice. So that everyone's on the same page to understand the significance of why I'm going through these temples and the winter solstice, which are found in every culture, continent, tribe, and tongue, we need to back up and find out why the enemy is influencing these cultures to do this. We know that God is not involved in this deity sun god worship, but why out of everything that Satan could have chosen, why did he influence these cultures to create physical temples in such a way to have the sun, the created object in the sky, shine through them and then create a deity around that sun? Why did he do it? I'm going to suggest to you because he only knows how to twist what God has already established. He only knows how to fake things and to imitate and mock the Most High God. Because the Bible says that those who follow God, that believe in Yeshua Jesus, are the temple of the Holy Spirit. The temple was never supposed to be a physical structure. It's supposed to be the creator of the universe, the Son of the living God that shines in us and through us. Revelation chapter 21, verse 23 says that when the new Jerusalem comes down, it's not even going to need any light. There's not going to be any need for the sun or the moon because the glory of God will be its light. The Lamb will be its lamp. In other words, the Son of the living God will be the only light that shines in the New Jerusalem. And we are the predecessor to that light. And that's what Satan's trying to hide. He wanted the ancient people of the earth to be distracted from the one true God by worshiping the creation. And today his agenda is to get God's people to worship him through man-made holidays instead of God-ordained holy days. So Satan chose this day, the winter solstice, added a solar deity to it, then threaded it all throughout time, and then eventually his plan was to get it into the church. Because if he could get it into the church, then the people of God would move away from the true calendar of God and be paralyzed from receiving the full power and authority in the earth that he desires for his people to have. He would trick us into not doing Bible things in Bible ways, but literally mocking God through a date chosen by Satan to worship him, and all the while, we wouldn't have a clue that we're offending the one true God the entire time. My friends, this date is critical. It's important that we understand where it comes from because in the evidence that we're gonna be showing throughout this video to get to the answer of, of December 25th on trial and why did we choose it, this winter solstice and the temples are a foundational part of that evidence. If it can be established that the pagans were worshiping solar deities on the winter solstice before the Roman church chose the date for the birthday of Christ, then it's all too possible that the church chose that date because it was a pagan celebration in their effort to displace it, an act that we will see later is biblically illegal. But before we make any conclusions just yet, let's get back to our trial. Earlier, we showed how the Egyptian temple of Amun-Ra was connected to the winter solstice and how they believed that the rays of the sun on that day caused the sun to be reborn. Now, let's go over to a Greek philosopher named Plutarch, who lived in the first century, and let him tell us why they built his temple around the winter solstice. He says, and I quote, For this reason, it is said that the goddess Isis, when she was aware of her being pregnant, put on a protective amulet on the sixth day of Phaophi, and on the winter solstice, she gave birth to Hippocrates. Now, Hippocrates was the sun god Horus as a child. It literally means the child Horus. Horus was the sun god of Egypt, and Plutarch is reporting that he was born on the winter solstice. So not only does Plutarch tell us that the sun god of Egypt was born on the winter solstice, but he does so long before a single Catholic writer ever decided to figure out what the birthday of Christ was. This piece of evidence is critical because it proves that both Rome and Egypt had sun gods that they believed were born on the winter solstice. And in the first century, it was December 25th. And in the case of Rome, there is evidence that they actually worshipped the sun god on December 25th, which of course was the winter solstice in that time period. But Egypt and Rome are not the only cultures that bring us a sun god that was said to be born on the winter solstice. Bishop Epiphanius of Solomon, who lived in the fourth century, 
details for us that the Greeks also had a celestial god that was born on this very same day. He described what happens on December 25th in his time when he says the following. First, at Alexandria in the Corium, as they call it, it's a very large temple, the Shrine of Cor. They stay up all night singing hymns to the idol with the flute accompaniment. And when you ask them what this mystery means, they reply that today is the hour of Cor, that is the virgin, when she gives birth to Eon. Eon is the chief cosmic god of the Greeks, and he's depicted as being in charge of the entire year and the zodiac. And Epiphanius tells us that this false god was also born on December 25th. And although the Roman church today has done a great job of convincing a lot of people that December 25th was never a pagan holiday, much less the birthday of a pagan sun god, history and their own bishops tell a completely different story. Epiphanius not only tells us that the Greeks celebrated the birthday of their god on December 25th, but within a few lines of that quote, he goes on to say that virtually every other pagan culture of his time period had a celebration on December 25th. He says this, and I quote, Greeks, I mean the idolaters, celebrate this day, the winter solstice, on the 8th before the calends of January, which is another way of saying eight days before the 1st of January, or December 25th. The Romans call it Saturnalia, Egyptians Cronia, Alexandrians Sicilia. The winter solstice was not only the birthday, my friends, of the Egyptian and Greek gods, but Epiphanius tells us it was celebrated by the largest cultures of his time. And he lived in the 300s. And speaking of the 300s, let's take a look at the next exhibit, which is none other than the Roman calendar from 354 AD that literally states that December 25th was the birthday of the Roman sun god. This calendar was created by a calligrapher named Philocallus for a wealthy Christian named Valentinus. In part six of this calendar, it actually has December 25th listed as a pagan Roman holiday. Here's the exact entry. It says, quote, birthday of the unconquered, games ordered, 30 races. Now this is the oldest literary reference to the pagan feast of Sol Invictus, the sun god of Rome that we have. Did you hear what it said? December 25th is marked on the only surviving Roman calendar that we have from that time period, and it says that it's the birthday of a Roman sun god. Now we know that the Roman Christians were celebrating December 25th as the birthday of Christ at this time, because ironically, on this very same calendar of 354, December 25th is also mentioned as the birthday of Christ. And we know that they didn't celebrate it in the third century on December 25th, because Dr. Stephen Hidgmans tells us that in the De Pascha Computus, which was written in 243 AD to determine the date of Easter, they argued that Christ, the new son of righteousness, must have been born on March 28th. This tells us that in the mid-third century, the date of Christmas was not yet known, and its date would be chosen sometime after this and before 354 calendar, most likely during the reign of Emperor Constantine of the 330s. But do we have any more evidence of sun worship in Rome before 354? We most certainly do. Not only do we have Emperor Aurelian dedicating a temple to the sun god Sol Invictus in 274 AD, archaeology has uncovered the sun god Sol Invictus minted on Roman coins in the 4th century, 3rd century, 2nd century, 1st century, and even as far back as the 1st century BC. Out of every god available in the Pantheon, in every century that Rome existed, the emperor chose to have Sol Invictus as the head of every Roman coin. It is also a well-documented fact that the emperor Constantine, before his alleged conversion to Christianity, was a dedicated sun god worshiper, proving that sun worship was alive and well in Rome. And what day do you think they celebrated the birthday of the sun and all of these sun gods? On the only day of the year that they believed the sun was reborn, the winter solstice, December 25th. Emperor Julian confirms when the Romans worshipped their sun god. He says this in 361 AD, quote, Before the beginning of the year, at the end of the month, which we call after Kronos, our December, we celebrate in honor of Helios, the Greek sun god, the most splendid games, and we dedicate the festival to the invincible sun. My friends, it cannot get any more clear than this. Even the Roman emperor states that at the end of December, they had a major celebration to the sun god, and we know the day in question was December 25th, because it was actually on the calendar in 354 that tells us this. And we've already displayed that. The Catholic Encyclopedia says this about Helios. Helios Mithras is one god, and Sunday was kept holy in honor of Mithra. 
The 25th of December was observed as his birthday, the Natalius Invicti, the rebirth of the winter sun, unconquered by the rigors of the season. You can see that even the Catholic scholars admit that Greek sun god Helios and the Roman sun god Mithras became one god and his birthday was December 25th and Sunday was his day. Which, by the way, is exactly why today most of Christianity has church and celebrates the Sabbath on Sunday. It's not because Jesus rose from the dead on Sunday. It's because the Romans chose to officially change the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday in 321 AD under Emperor Constantine. Because that's the day the pagans had their Sabbath, and it was easier to get the pagans to convert to Christianity if they were allowed to keep their pagan traditions. The church's position was to let people still celebrate it, but now we're going to do it for Jesus. That kind of compromise in the changing of the laws and the times is how the church has operated from the very beginning. That's exactly how they chose December 25th. They tried to conquer a pagan day and redeem it, forgetting that God has never been interested in redeeming pagan days of worship. He already has his own special days that he wants his people to worship him on. He has only been interested in redeeming people from pagan worship. Can you imagine the Israelites trying to take a pagan altar and use it to worship the God of Israel when they were specifically forbidden to do so in Deuteronomy chapter 12? By the way, if the subject of the Sabbath interests you and you'd like to find out how it too was changed, I encourage you to click the link at the top of this video or click the link in the description for more information. Now you might be thinking to yourself, isn't the winter solstice on December 21st? If you're talking about today's corrected Gregorian calendar, you'd be correct. But the current calendar has only been in effect since 1582 to replace the Julian calendar that was created in 46 BC that was off by 11 minutes each year. So in the original Julian calendar, the winter solstice was on December 25th and it continued to be celebrated on that day out of tradition, even though the solstice began to shift to different days due to the Julian calendar not being perfectly accurate. We know that December 25th was originally on the winter solstice because Roman historian Pliny the Elder in 63 AD tells us exactly that. He says, quote, The Bruma, which is the winter solstice, begins on the 8th degree of Capricorn, the 8th day before the Calends of January, which again is another way of saying 8 days before the 1st of January, which is December 25th. That comes directly from an historian in the 1st century. And speaking of cultures that worship sun gods on the winter solstice, as I mentioned earlier, it's not just the ancient Egyptian and Roman cultures of the early centuries that venerated the sun on this day. We see the same pattern all over the world and throughout all time. The Aztecs, for example, of Mexico. Not only did they have many of their temples built with the winter solstice in mind, but according to Aztec theology, their god, Huitzilopochtli, was also said to be born on the winter solstice. And if we head back across the Pacific Ocean to Japan, we find another sun god story that takes place on the very same winter solstice. According to Japanese Shintoism legend, the sun goddess Amaterasu is coaxed out of a cave on the winter solstice by the god of happiness after fleeing from her brother who is in a state of rage. When the sun goddess comes out on the winter solstice, she's said to be, quote, reborn. The sun comes alive again. In Shintoism, their followers still celebrate this ancient ceremony called Toji Tosai by lighting candles and worshiping the sun goddess every year on this day. And I'm certainly not saying that the Aztecs of the 13th century or Japanese Shintoism or any quote that I've mentioned after the 4th century has any influence on the decision in the 4th century to make Christ's birthday on December 25th. What I am displaying, though, is a pattern of sun god worship that happens to be on the winter solstice that's found on every continent for the last 5,000 years. And since we know that the Aztecs had no clue that the Romans ever existed, either they migrated originally from the Middle East thousands of years earlier and brought sun god worship on the winter solstice with them, or they learned it directly from demons, possibly the same demons that they summoned during their human sacrifices. Either way, it seems that one of the most important days of worship for Satan was on December 25th. Even modern-day Wiccans celebrate the birthday of their god on the winter solstice celebrating it at none other than the ancient Stonehenge that we mentioned earlier. They call it, of all things, Yule Day, which is the same ancient name that Germanic and Scandinavian peoples gave it thousands of years earlier. And interestingly enough, the ancient Vikings refer to Yule Day as Odin's Day. 
Did you catch that? Out of every single day of the year that they could have ever chosen to be Odin's Day, which as most scholars say is the precursor for the development of some of the attributes of Santa Claus, they chose December 25th, the winter solstice, as his day. Although I could continue to list other pagan deities that were worshipped on this day, we will leave this section with one final piece of evidence. And this evidence comes from none other than the Church of Satan themselves. Although the following quote is not an ancient academic piece of evidence, it is definitely eye-opening to say the least. Here's what they say on their own website about December 25th, and I quote, The Christians stole this holiday from the pagans. The Nazarene, or Christian, has little place in the general public celebration of this season, which were meant by pagans to be celebrations of abundance during the season of cold and emptiness. So for the Yule holiday season, we enjoy the richness of life and the company of people whom we cherish, as we will often be the only ones who know where the traditions really came from. I don't know about you, but we are not even halfway through this trial, and December 25th is not looking so innocent as we were led to believe. When the Church of Satan is claiming that one, their master invented this day for the worship of himself, and two, that each individual is supposed to indulge in self-gratification, which is exactly what happens most of the time during Christmas holidays, and three, it's backed up by countless cultures throughout time being influenced by Satan to worship sun gods on this day, it appears to me that the ancient winter solstice was in fact a major pagan day of worship to Satan himself. And this gave the Catholic Church the motive to try to take it over and make it their own. But that's just what I think. Tell me what you think in the comments below. But the main problem for the Roman Church was not only December 25th, the winter solstice, and the birthday of the Roman sun god, but Christians were joining in the celebrations left and right at such an alarming rate that even in the second century, the early church leaders were up in arms about what to do about it. They had no idea what to do because their congregations were taking part in the Feast of Saturnalia on the winter solstice and New Year's Day. Saturnalia was a massively popular Roman festival that ended right before the birthday of the sun god on the winter solstice, and Christians were getting caught up in the celebrations of it. Take a look at the following quotes from that early time period. This is from Tertullian, an early church father from 145 to 220 AD. He says this, and I quote, but the same apostle, talking about the Apostle Paul, elsewhere bids us to take care to please all. As I, he says, please all by all means. No doubt he used to please them by celebrating the Feast of Saturnalia and New Year's Day. The Saturnalia and New Year's and Midwinter's festivals and Matronalia are frequented. Presents come and go, New Year's gifts, games join their noise, and banquets join their din. O oh, better fidelity of the nations to their own sect, which claims no solemnity of the Christians for itself, not that the Lord's Day, not Pentecost, even if they had known about them, would they have ever shared them with us, for they would have fear that they should seem to be Christians. We are not apprehensive, lest we should seem to look like heathens. My friends, do you hear what he's saying? In other words, he's in sarcasm saying, look, you guys are reading that Paul was all things to all people. But does that mean that he went out and celebrated with the heathens for crying out loud? He says, you guys have no problem in going out and celebrating pagan feast days and looking like heathens. But you know that they would never come and celebrate a Christian holiday because they'd be afraid that they would look like a Christian. And this is the second and third centuries where Christians were getting caught up in celebrating pagan winter festivals. And that's exactly what we're doing today. We're celebrating things that pagans celebrate and we have no shame in it at all. It should be a big red flag that Christians were celebrating right alongside the pagans, and it should be a greater red flag that actual physical pagans today and Wiccans celebrated too, saying that this is their holiday and we stole it. And I tend to agree based on the evidence. Even Bishop Martin of Braga in 575 AD had this to say about Christians who are adopting pagan practices into Christmas. Look at this particular quote. He says, quote, you shall not perform the wicked celebrations of the Calends and observe the holiday of the Gentiles, nor shall you decorate your houses with laurel and green branches. This whole celebration is pagan. While we're trying to figure out in the 21st century whether or not Christmas comes from pagan roots, this 1,500-year-old bishop seems to already know exactly that, that these winter holidays at the end of the year are pagan. So the dilemma was that Christians were celebrating this particular holiday with the pagans, 
and borrowing their traditions. And the newly budding Catholic Church didn't know what to do about it. So since Christians everywhere were celebrating these pagan feasts and the church couldn't get them to stop, the only option was to use the old, if you can't beat them, join them philosophy. And that's exactly what I believe that happened. By choosing the pagan feast day of December 25th as the birthday of Christ, the church could tell Christians to keep on celebrating, but now do so in the name of the real Son of God. During this entire trial, my friends, we've been trying to answer the question, why did the Catholic Church choose December 25th to be the birthday of Christ? The following quote by a 12th century bishop is our last eyewitness testimony. He answers this question quite plainly. Check out what he has to say. It's powerful. Syriac Bishop Jacob Barsalabi says this in the 1100s. Quote, the reason why the fathers of the church moved the January 6th celebration to December 25th was this, they said. Listen carefully. It was the custom of the heathens to celebrate on this same December 25th the birthday of the sun, and they lit lights on it to exalt that day. Even Christians were participant in these rites and ceremonies. When, therefore, the teachers of the church saw that the Christians inclined themselves to this custom, they established a plan. And what was that plan? The true natal feast, Christmas, would be celebrated on this day, December 25th, and the Epiphany on January 6th. Brothers and sisters, you can't get any more clear than this. This 12th century Christian bishop who knows his history said, look, this is why we're celebrating this on December 25th. It was a pagan day, the Christians were celebrating it, the church didn't know what to do, so they adopted the date on their own. They continued to allow the Christians to celebrate it because they knew they weren't going to be able to stop them and just told them to celebrate it for Christ. It appears that in the 1100s, it was very common knowledge in the church that December 25th date was chosen because it was an existing pagan day of worship to a sun god, and the church tried to hijack it. And because the Catholic Church grew exponentially, it did eventually displace sun god worship on December 25th as it began to evangelize and conquer land after land. Instead of teaching the heathens to follow the one true God his way, they simply began to syncretize and borrow from the customs of those pagans until we get to almost every custom that we have today dealing with Christmas. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, who cares if the date they chose was previously the birthday of a sun god? Wouldn't it be a good thing that the church took over a pagan date for Christ? That sounds great from our perspective, but in just a few minutes, I'm going to show you in Scripture where God forbids us from taking a former pagan practice of worship and converting it over to Him. Still so stick with me because I'm going to also show you at the end the shocking truth of what the enemy is really trying to hide through all of this. Something that when our family discovered it, it changed our lives forever. Now some say that December 25th was chosen because the early church writers mathematically concluded that Christ was actually born on that day. They mainly quote Hippolytus and Africanus as their sources. But as we shall see shortly as we walk into these particular quotes, you're going to see just how much of a lack of evidence there really is. Although it's true that there were a few writers who came up with the December 25th date as a guess, a closer examination will reveal, one, that these guesses did not come from any academic mindset, but from superstition, and two, these early quotes had been suspiciously handpicked from a myriad of dates that Christians calculated. Historian Clement Miles explained this in his classic 1912 work, Christmas Customs and Traditions. He said this, There's not a single month in the year to which the nativity has not been assigned by some writer or another. December 25th is only one of various guesses of early Christian writers. Saint Clement himself, who lived at the end of the second century, believed that Christ was born on November 17th. This means by the end of the second century, the date had not even been set yet. We know from all the previous empirical evidence that has been presented thus far that the church chose December 25th to dethrone the pagan sun god and to make it easier for pagans to convert to Christianity. So I don't know about you, but it's awfully convenient that in modern times, it retroactively went back, found a couple of people that actually guessed that date right. They could have guessed about any date of the month and found someone who guessed that date. But that's not what really happened. So let's take a look at a couple of these quotes from the other side of the aisle and see how credible they actually are. One of the most popular early writers or chronographers that came up with the December 25th date is apparently someone named Hippolytus of Rome in the 3rd century. 
His entire chronography timeline was not only debunked within a decade of releasing it, but there's evidence that it's not even credible. Let's take a look at that quote and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. Quote, For the first advent of our Lord in the flesh when he was born in Bethlehem, eight days before the calends of January, the fourth day of the week, while Augustus was in his 42nd year, but from Adam 5,500 years. According to the Catholic Encyclopedia, they say this quote is not even authentic. They say, The relevant passage, which exists in the Chigi manuscript without the bracketed words, says this and every time it's quoted prior to circa 1000 AD. In other words, the original quote is the following. For the first coming of our Lord and the flesh in Bethlehem took place in the reign of Augustus in the year 5500, and he suffered in his 33rd year. Everything that you see there in brackets is not in the original. This means that we have to throw out Hippolytus. It's not even genuine. At the very least, it's extraordinarily questionable. And the Catholic Encyclopedia goes on to say, interpolation is certain and admitted by scholars Funk and Bon Wesch. The next quote that we have, and the last one that we're going to deal with today, is Julius Sextus Africanus. All over the internet, he's quoted as stating that December 25th is the birth date of Christ, yet virtually no one ever actually states his exact quote. After extensive research, I finally found the actual quote in question and was shocked at what he actually said. This is the quote. Judea has seen its bloom and the country is fading. To Gentiles and aliens, salvation has come. To the wretched, relief is ministered abundantly. With right do women dance and say, Lady Pege, spring bearer, thou mother of the heavenly constellation. Now, friends, this is where they say that Julius Sextus Africanus says that Jesus was born on December 25th. But where is that? It's not actually there because he never said it. You have to do some extreme gymnastics with his words, which is exactly what they did, and here's how they did it. First, they start with the understanding that the ancients believed that the earth was born on March 25th, the spring equinox, and that great men are born and die on the same day. So because they believe that Christ died on March 25th, being a great man, he must have been born on that date as well. And because Africanus uses the word spring bearer, that somehow means that Julius believes that Christ must have been born in the spring. The problem is that they didn't even stick to the superstition formula that great men are born and died on the same day. They changed it to Christ died and was conceived on the same day. And of course, if you go nine months from March 25th, you end up on December 25th. The truth is that not only is all of that based on superstition and manipulation of a formula, it's not even what he said and it's not what he meant. The context, if you keep reading, is talking about water. He's referring to a spring of water, not the season of spring. And the actual Greek bears that out because Lady Pege is, is simply a personification of the Greek word Pege, which simply means the well that is fed by a spring. He's basically saying that Mary, the mother of Christ, has a wealth of water inside of her that's fed by Christ himself. He's the water. He's the spring. So it now becomes clear why no one actually quotes Africanus in his belief that Christ was born on December 25th because there's actually no quote to support that invented claim. Okay, we've nearly come to the end of our trial, so let's begin the process of recapping what we've discovered. In the end, the only argument that's used to prove that December 25th was not chosen because it was a pagan holiday is these church writers, who we've just shown are not legitimate and cannot be used as credible evidence. And even if they could be trusted, they could in no way overturn all the previous evidence that is to the contrary irrefutable evidence that December 25th was celebrated as the birthday of sun gods before the Roman church chose it as the birthday of Christ. The strange part about all of this is that those who support this argument are saying that the church didn't choose December 25th because of any kind of syncretism or merging of pagan ideas, yet we're supposed to believe that they chose December 25th because a few early church writers came up with that date using pagan traditions and ancient Jewish superstitions? That doesn't make any sense. Every early church writer on this subject uses legitimate formulas for trying to figure out the death and birth of Christ, except for the ones that came up with the December 25th date. They used a formula based on superstition. Furthermore, to believe that the Catholic Church was somehow a purist in this decision and would in no way mix paganism with the holy, you'd have to ignore all the facts of history and even modern history at that. 
After all, they've had no problem putting the same solar disk behind the heads of all their saints that the pagans use behind their solar deities. They've had no issue putting actual pagan statues in the Vatican itself, even renaming some of them to the names of biblical characters such as Peter, Mary, and even the baby Jesus. Even Pope Francis had no problem in controversially displaying modern pagan idols in the church. In 2019, he said that they were displayed, but quote, without idolatrous intentions. Now, would any of you have a pagan idol in your own home just for display? And if that's not enough, they got John the Baptist's birthday on the summer solstice, chose All Saints Day to be on the Pagan Day of the Dead, which became the famous Halloween of today, which by the way, if you haven't seen the teaching, Should Christians Celebrate Halloween? I encourage you to click the link above or the one in the description to watch it. You will utterly be shocked beyond belief at what you've not been told. So for us to believe that the Catholic Church did not choose December 25th because it was pagan, but chose it because there were early writers that used pagan superstitions to come up with that date, is not only confusing, it's disingenuous at best, and it goes against all of the existing evidence. But speaking of evidence, let's review some of that evidence and bring this trial to a close so we can reach a final verdict. We learned that number one, the winter solstice was in fact on December 25th, and it was celebrated as a pagan holiday to sun gods, as stated by multiple early church writers, historians, and Egyptian sources. Number two, we learned that December 25th was not only the pagan sun god's birthday in Egypt, but the Roman calendar in 354 AD reinforces this by telling us that it was the Roman sun god's birthday as well. Number three, the record shows that the Roman church had a problem when they discovered Christians were celebrating the feast of Saturnalia and these winter feast days, and they had to do something about it. Number four, we found a 12th century manuscript from a Syriac writer who tells us that the teachers of the church changed the birthday of Christ to December 25th because Christians were celebrating with the pagans on that day. Number five, we learned that Hippolytus and Africanus can't be trusted in their quotes, one being a later interpolation and the other having nothing to do with the birthday of Christ at all, but more of the spring of water that was in Mary. From the Egyptian sun god Horus being born on the winter solstice, to cultures all over the world celebrating their sun god's birthday on this day, from multiple quotes from early church writers telling us that December 25th was a pagan holiday to the same writers rebuking their congregations for even thinking of celebrating these days in the church, I think it's safe to say without a shadow of a doubt the evidence points to a single conclusion. Guilty as charged. December 25th was an existing pagan holiday dedicated to the birthday of the sun for thousands of years. Christians were joining the pagans in their celebration and the Roman church chose to adopt the holiday, change the name, then they called it their own. And then in modern times, in an attempt to whitewash the original motives of the church, some chose to pick out a couple of quotes from early church writers who chose December 25th, or should I say guessed December 25th, out of complete superstition, just because it, was, it just so happened to match the date that they had already chosen. This is biblically illegal. I've mentioned this several times before, but now we're actually gonna go through the scripture and show you why it's biblically illegal. Deuteronomy chapter 12 makes it really clear that we cannot borrow from the pagans and then worship our God likewise. Like I mentioned earlier, read it with me. Verse 30 says this, Take heed to yourself that you are not ensnared to follow after them, after they're destroyed from before you, and that you do not inquire after their gods, saying, How did these nations serve their gods? I will do so likewise. You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way. For every abomination to the Lord which he hates, they've done to their gods. For they burn even their sons and daughters in the fire to their gods. Whatever I command you, be careful to observe it. You shall not add or take away from it. This is what happened with ancient Israel. When they went into the promised land, God warned them and said, don't go into the promised land and look into how they worship their gods and then borrow from them and worship me in those ways. Don't do it. He said, don't add to or take away from my word. Worship me in how I request. Somehow we've gotten to the place where we've said, that's not what it means to me. I worship God. I'm celebrating the birthday of Christ. What's wrong with that? My friends, if you are the one being worshiped, like we've said multiple times, that's not a problem. But unfortunately, like I've said several times now, it doesn't matter what it means to us. It only matters what it means to him. He's the one being worshiped. Either we care how he wants us to worship him, or we care about how we want to worship him. 
So as the verdict becomes guilty, we find ourselves asking the question, why would the enemy do this to begin with? Why is it such an incredible parade of all these different players that come on all these different stages to pull God's people attention away from the stage that's over there? And what is that stage? That stage is the real holiday calendar of God. It's the real prophetic feast day calendar that he's trying to hide. Because the enemy knows that if he can keep us away from what God really wants us to do, we'll be out of sync with his calendar and miss the incredible blessings that go along with it. For instance, Yeshua, Jesus, had died on Passover at the precise time they killed the Passover lamb, was put in the grave during the Feast of Unleavened Bread when they were removing all leaven, which represents sin, from their homes. He rose on the Feast of First Fruits when the high priest was cutting the barley from the earth and waving it before God, asking for a great harvest in the fall. And the Holy Spirit came down on Shavuot, or better known in the Greek as Pentecost. That's the first four spring days of the Lord that deal with His first coming. Every one of these feast days are about Christ. But did you know that the second coming of Christ is foretold through the last three fall feast days, where he comes during Yom Terah, the Feast of Trumpets, or more commonly known as Rosh Hashanah, which was the day when all the ancient kings of Israel were coronated as king through the sound of a trumpet. Then there's Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, where high priests went into the Holy of Holies one time per year to atone for the sins of Israel, which is connected to the final great white throne judgment of God. And lastly, we have the Feast of Tabernacles, Sukkot, which is when the marriage supper of the Lamb of Revelation happens. And it's also the time when Jesus was actually born and began tabernacling among us. Which, by the way, if you text the word CALENDAR to 844-763-9543 right now, we will immediately send you a downloadable PDF of all the feast days of the Bible and how they relate to us today. And if you'd like to learn more about when Jesus actually was born, feel free to click the link above or in the description. So when the sun is fully set, what we discover is the enemy's trying to hide our inheritance. He's stolen it, and in place of it, he's given us a Catholic feast day holiday schedule that's pulled our attention and destroyed our ability to teach our children the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. If you're a Catholic and you're okay with the fact that the church replaced God's calendar with their own, then I suppose it makes sense for you to celebrate Catholic holidays. But if you're a believer that truly wants to follow God's Word and be in rhythm and in sync with His ways, doesn't it make more sense for us to start learning His calendar? My friends, there's so much in our history that we don't know that has radically affected our lives and our spirituality, our kids, and our family. We need to learn these things and our history so we can do Bible things in Bible ways. We need to put aside the doctrines and the tradition of men and start following God in spirit and in truth. And speaking of truth, now that you know the truth, there's only one question left to answer. What are you going to do about it? Thank you for following along with me on our little trial journey of when, why, and how December 25th got chosen as the birthday of Christ. If you want to be notified of exclusive content, text me the word EXCLUSIVE to 844-763-763. 9543, and you'll be immediately added to our exclusive list of subscribers. For now, I encourage you to click the button on your screen to watch a short 16-minute video giving you an overview of all the feast days of the Lord. If you're not really familiar with them, you will definitely be blessed to learn just how much they're all about Christ and how they affect you today. Thank you, my friends, again for taking the time to watch this documentary. Until next time, I'm Jim Staley, and I'll see you in the next video.